Okay then, I think we're ready to go. So thank you very much all for coming along. Welcome, uh, especially warm welcome if you haven't been to a Gresham College lecture before. I think it's probably time that we start it. And I also noticed coming in that it's probably half term. Um, and you may have gathered that my lecture is about probability. And it's part of the lecture series I'm giving this year that we're taking some examples of fundamental concepts of mathematics and how they've evolved. And the idea of probability or randomness or chance is very old and goes back centuries and its study started with investigating gambling and games of chance. But however, its rigorous formulation was relatively recently, only 80 years ago last year, in 1933. Is there an echo from the... Yes, that's not quite right. There's something wrong with the sound. It may be me. <laughs> in which case, we've got a difficulty. Is that better now? I can hear a little... I could hear a little feedback, but I can't hear it now. Is that a bit better? Right, Okay. Well, probability is a subject that's got many applications in science, engineering, finance, the social sciences, medical statistics, and it underlies, of course, the subject of statistics and indeed of quantum theory, quantum mechanics. And what I want to do, because it's only a, a 45, 50 minute lecture, is just to take some key features of probability and try to illustrate two facets of it, one of which is that it displays quite a lot of regularity, and on the other hand, it can dis um, convey or um, show quite a lot of surprising behaviour. So we're looking at the, the two side of things. So let me give you an overview of, of what I'm going to be talking about. And in order to, as I always try to do, to inform you know, your future reading or if you want to do any future study or whatever, I want to give you a little bit of the, the terminology of the subject of probability. So I'll be talking about sample spaces and probability and giving you the language in which probability is couched and how it's described. And I'm going to approach them in a restricted set of circumstances in which we'll be looking at events that are um, equally likely, and I'll describe what that means, such as tossing a coin or um, throwing a dice or um, selecting from a pack of cards, uh, because we can illustrate all the features we want to, and the uh, development into the more abstract situation, once you're familiar with that, there is really not too difficult at all. Then I want to go, as I usually do, put a little bit of history into it and talk about um, the work of two famous French mathematicians, Pierre de Fermat and Blaise Pascal, who are often thought to be the founders of modern probability. And I'm going to look at a, one of the, they, they considered gambling questions, but I want to look at one of the questions they considered, which is quite interesting, which is the interrupted game which is where you and I decide that we're going to play a game, and the game consists of tossing a coin, and the first person to win four times is going to win the game. So we keep tossing the coin until one of us has, has won four times. And then the fire alarm goes, and the fire alarm goes when you've won two, and I've won one game. I've won one toss. Uh, sorry, I've won one toss. Yes, you've won two tosses. How do we divide the stake? How do we divide the prize? And that can be solved, that was solved by Fermi using this equally likely idea, and it's quite a useful um, example to look at. Right. Then I want to compare the two things. I want to take it to the limit, which is why I chose the title as I did. And it turns out that the way I'll be talking about probabilities is very, up to now, very axiomatic. I'll be essentially taking a sample space and I'll be ascribing a number to each of them, and I'll call that number a probability. And in this section, I want to show that that way of doing things coincides with your intuitive idea of what a probability is, or perhaps what your intuitive idea of what a probability is, is that if you keep tossing a coin by saying it's fair, you mean in the long run that the proportion of heads tends towards a half. So I'll be, on one hand, doing it axiomatically, and the other hand, I'll be trying to um, show how that coincides with, with your intuition. But although we have that regularity coming into it, some of the sample outcomes that you can get when you, let's say, repeatedly toss a coin, which is a very rich example I'll be looking at, are very sort of surprising results. And a way to think of it is that if you're on the motorway and the traffic is slowing down and you have to choose a lane that you go into, well, we all know you choose the lane, you choose, I choose the lane that seems to be going slowest. 
you know. And that's what I mean by random walks and bad luck. I'll show you that bad luck is to be expected. <laughs> In a very surprising way. When I first saw it, I, you know, it really did make me sit back. I may have had a sheltered life up to then, but, <laughs> but I did find it very surprisingly. Then again, to bring you into the more modern things, as I say, try to develop in the lecture and finish off with something that's um, uh, much more recent. Um, look at what Einstein, one, one of Einstein's major results in that marvellous year he had of 1905, when he contributed to quantum theory, relativity, um, E equals MC squared, and particularly I want to talk about Brownian motion, which is the motion of, a, a, if you put a small particle in a liquid, it undergoes an erratic, jittery, um, wiggly kind of motion because it's being bombarded by the molecules of the liquid and they're not always in balance. So sometimes they'll give it a little push in one direction so the, the um, little particle will tend to move around. And I'll show that one of the best ways of thinking about Brownian motion is as a limit of a random walk, again, the idea of limit. And that's important because many random situations are described by such random processes. It's a very important member of the toolkit of modern mathematics, modern stochastic processes in a variety of areas. OK, well, let's start with um, getting ourselves up to speed with the, the terminology and the, um, um, the main underlying ideas. So probability used for situations which occur randomly. For example, the outcome of tossing a coin or the length of time between two successive earthquakes, perhaps, in an earthquake zone. And the standard terminology in probability, and the one that I want to use, is to call these situations in which the outcomes happen randomly experiments <clears throat> and the set of all possible outcomes, the sample space. So I've given three sets of examples here. In one of them, just to reinforce the, the terms, the experiment is to toss a coin. There are two possible outcomes. So the sample space consists of heads and tails. That's a finite sample space. It only has two elements in it, a finite number of elements. On the other hand, your experiment could be to keep tossing a coin until you obtain heads. And note the number of tosses obt required, obtained, before you get the first heads. And there the sample space... In theory, it could be any natural number, one, two, three, four, five. You could be particularly unfortunate and you could keep getting heads for quite a long run before you obtain your head. Your, uh, your head. Uh, you could obtain tails quite a long time before you obtain head. And therefore, the sample space has got an infinite number of members, but they're all what we call discrete. There are gaps between them, between one, two, and three, and four, and so on. Or the third one is measure the time between two successive earthquakes. There are lots of things you could do, experiments that are measuring time. And here the sample space is the set of positive real numbers. Now that's a different kind of infinity. It's called the continuous infinity, the set of positive real numbers that's got no gaps in it. It's, 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 it's continuous, which is what that means. So there we have an experiment, and the experiment can give rise to a set of outcomes. Now what you do when you try to what we want to do is to put a probability onto the sample space and I'm just going to deal with the cases where the probability I'm going to impose is only going to be imposed upon finite sets. So I'm only dealing with the finite case and therefore it's discrete. And I'm only going to deal with the case where the probability I'm going to assign or associate or impose is going to be assigning the same number to each member of the sample space. So it's what we call the equally likely situation. Now what I'm doing is I'm just saying I'm associating the number, for example here, to the sample space, which is of the experiment tossing a coin twice, of head, 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 tail, tail, head, tail, tail. I'm going to associate the same number to each of them, and it's a convention in probability that you have the numbers adding up to one. So if I'm associating the same number to each of them and they add up to one, you're immediately there. You know that the association is of a quarter. Um, let me try another definition. So this is the last of our series of definitions, I think. Um, an event is then the name for a collection of outcomes. So an event is for a collection of outcomes. And because I've associated the same probability to each outcome, you get the probability of an event by just counting the, num counting the number of ways 
that the event can, can occur, the number of outcomes in the event, and divide by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So the event of zero heads, which is the event just getting tail-tail, that's probability a quarter. It can only happen in one way. The event of exactly one head, well, how can that happen? It can happen as head-tail or as tail-head. It can only happen in two ways. So its probability is two over four or a half. And the event of two heads has probability a quarter. So that, for example, if you... Um, so you're able to then... You know, I was going to give you another example, but I think I'll move on to the dice one. because I, I, Now, this quote was given to me by a lawyer and therefore I felt able to use it, but I think it's quite nice anyway. So, dice are small polka-dotted cubes of ivory constructed like a lawyer to lie upon any side, commonly the wrong one. Now, I, I apologise to any members of that noble profession who may be here, and I shall be leaving immediately after the lecture by the door at the back. Um, in any case, what we have there is a sample space consisting of six outcomes. And what you mean by saying the dice is fair is that you associate the number one over six to each of those outcomes. You see, I'm trying to avoid what may have worried you in school, may still have been worrying you now, um, that there's a circuitous, circuitous nature to defining probabilities. You see, I'm trying to avoid that. I'm cutting through it. I'm saying a probability is an association to events within the sample space. And then a later section of the lecture will, will be telling you that that can be shown to co coincide with our idea of a probability being a relative frequency. All right? So this is the axiomatic approach that was developed by Kolmogorov, that you have a sample space and you associate probabilities with certain subsets of that sample space. So here, just to push it through, possible events, the outcome is the number two, the outcome is an odd number, well, the outcome is a number two. That can only happen in one way, so the probability is one over six. If the outcome is an odd number, that can happen in three ways. You get one or three or five. So the probability is three over six, uh, which is a half. And the outcome is odd, but does not exceed four. That happens in two ways, one and three. So the outcome is two over six. All right, let me turn to a more interesting problem. Um, the birthday problem. And it's to show you that it's exceptionally likely that there are at least two people in this room with the same birthday. And it is, however, I couldn't think of any easy way of trying to do an experiment with you to find out who those, those two people may be. But what I want you to do is to show you what this rather surprising result, um, what the surprising result, how we can obtain it. Uh, now, first of all, it's, it's an obvious comment, but it can be slightly surprising. If there were more people in this room, I think there's about 200 in the room at the moment, but if there were more people in this room than there are days in the year, then the probability that there'd be two with the same birthday would be one, because you've got more people than days in the year. So two people have to have the same birthday. Now, so the question is, if you've got less than that, how quickly does the number approach one? We know it has to go up to that. And the way to hit it, to do the counting, now remember I've said to you, to work out the probability of an event is essentially just a way of counting how many ways the event can occur. It turns out that counting the number of ways in which at least two people have the same birthday is actually quite hard to do. What is a lot easier is to count the number of ways the complementary event can occur. Now the complementary event is the other one which says that no people have the same birthday. That turns out to be easier to count. So we're going to count the number of ways in which no people have the same birthday and it must be the situation that either no people have the same birthday or at least two have the same birthday. They're exclusive events. So therefore if we can work out the probability that nobody has the same birthday and take that away from one we'll get the probability that there are at least two people in here with the same birthday. So that's the structure of the argument that we're going to do. If you think of the whole sample space, um, I'm dividing it into two subsets. So let's look at the size. If we've got four people, I'm just doing it for that number, you'll see how it can go up. 
um, four people, then the size of the sample space is just all possibilities for the first person's birthday, all possibilities for the second person's birthday, the third person, and the fourth person. So the size of the sample space is in that third paragraph is 365 by 365 by 365 by 365. So for four people, that's the number of listings you can have of four birthdays. But now, suppose that none of them have the same birthday. What's the event that none of these, count the number of ways in which people can, um, don't have the same birthday? Well, the first person can be in any one of the 365 days. 365 days. Of course, I'm ignoring leap years, etc. So the second one, therefore, can only have 364 choices if they're not to have the same birthday. And the third one, there are only 663 choices, but it's because it can't be any of the other two that you've already picked. And the fourth one can only have 362 ways of having a birthday that's not the same as that of the other three. So therefore, the event that none of them have the same birthday is putting together 365 by 364 by 363 by 362, divided by the sample space, and you get the answer 0.984, or I got the answer 0.984. So therefore, the probability that at least two of them have the same birthday is one minus that, and it's quite a small number. It's sort of uh, about 2%, right, 0.016. Now, if we were to do it for, for five or six or a uh, larger number than that, you see the idea the bottom just gets bigger by multiplying. If you were doing it for six people, you would multiply by another 365 and another 365 on the bottom. And on the top, you would have multiplied by 361, multiplied by 360. Now, you don't have to do that because I got my spreadsheet to do it. And if you look at it, these numbers are really quite surprising. Just four is still the same, 0.16. 16 people, 0.284. When you get to 23, you go above a half. So 23 people, with 23 people in a room, and their birthdays are distributed so that every day of the year has got the same chance as being a birthday as every other day, which is the way I set up the sample space. It's got a probability of more than a half. So with 23 people it's greater than a 50-50 chance that two, at least two will have the same birthday. But what's remarkable, and this is the curse of spreadsheets, you know, you've gone this far, you may as well keep going. And I went up as far as 200 and then had to change the formatting so that I could get enough decimal points on it. At 32 people, it's 0 0.75. At 40, 0 0.89. At 56, 0 0.98. And I did it for 100 because I thought there... Uh, it would be 100 people at the lecture, whereas, of course, there's 200 people at the lecture, but this is enough. So with 100 people, and the way to think about it is this, it's 0 0.9999997. If you had 10 million lecture theatres around the world, each with 100 people, there would only be three of them where nobody had the same birthday. There would only be three of them, of those 10 million groups of 100 people. So somewhat counterintuitive. But apart from that, there also, if you get a chance to look at it and ponder on it, you know, the way of calculating it has to do with counting and is, I, th I think, relatively accessible, but quite surprising. Okay. So let me now turn to Pascal and to Fermat, two great French mathematicians, uh, considered to be the founders of modern probability. They're probably not best known for this by any means. Fermat better known for his work in number theory and going around obtaining results but not proving them and writing them in margins and it taking two or three hundred years to prove them, like Fermat's last theorem. Pascal probably better known for his religious philosophy um, and philosophy generally than for his mathematics. Um, in mathematics, probably best known for his Pascal's triangle, uh, an array of numbers, which, which we're going to see in a moment, which has really got some beautiful properties. 
So the work arose out of a gambling question and an exchange of letters that they had in 1654. And I'm just going to take one of these, which is the one I consider the most interesting of them. And it's the problem of the, the interrupted game. And what the setup is going to be something like this here. You and I are going to decide to toss a coin. And let's say it's heads you win and tails I win, you know, something like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep tossing the coin, we're going to keep having those turns until one of us has four wins. It's the first one to reach four. Okay. And the stake for the game is £64. The reason 64 is because it's divisible by lots of twos. And the winner's the one who wins, first wins four times. Fire alarm goes, game is interrupted when you have won two games and I have won one game. How should we divide the £64 between us? In other words, what's the probability that you would have gone on to win given that you had two and that I would have gone on to win given that I had one? Now, your probability should be higher than mine. We can certainly say that because it was interrupted when you had two as opposed to me being one. Now, what Fermat's insight was to say, let's examine the... Let me set it up. Fermat's insight was to say, look... Let's imagine the game is played for another four turns. Right, it has been interrupted. You're at two, I'm at one. But let's imagine it goes on for another four turns. Now, that's the longest the game can last, is another four turns. It might take another four turns to complete because, for example, you're at two and I'm at one. Well, I could have won the next two, which would have made me three and you two, and then you win the next two and you win four, three. So... It could take four wins, it won't take more, but it could only take two wins. For example, you're at two, I'm at one, you win the next two, and you win. But what Fermat said was, let's consider all the possibilities of what could happen in the next four games and find out which, in which ones of them you win and in which ones of them I win. And this is the crux. All the ways the next four games can turn out are equally likely. That's why it works. Because you're just doing it again. Each one of the outcomes is as likely as every, one of, uh, every other one of the outcomes. That's the way I'd set it up. So let's do it then. So the outcomes are all equally likely. And Y is you and M is me. And here I've got them listed down. Um, top left, there's Y, 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 Y. That's where you win all of the next four games. And so certainly you're going to you're go, win all of the next four turns and certainly you're going to win the game because you win the first two. Look at the one second across on the top row, which is where you win the first three. So you certainly win the game. Here, you win the first two, you win the game. Here, the first two. Here, you win one, then I win one, but then you win the third one, so you win. Here, Y, M, Y, M. And across here as well. Here you win a turn, then I win two, so I'm coming along quite well. But then you win the next one and you win. And so with all of these here, there are 11 of them. They're the ways that you can win. And these seven here, sorry, these five here, these five here are the ways that I can win. So the probability that having been halted at the stage of you winning two and me winning one in the next four turns to go on, 11 of those will make you the winner, five of them will make me the winner, but each of those um, set of four turns are equally likely, so the probability is 11, 16 that you will win, 5, 16 that I will win. So of the 64 pounds, you should get 11, 16 of it, so that's 44 pounds, and I should get whatever the remainder of that is, which is 20, I think. So it was Fermat's approach, an equally likely approach. Cleverly, very, very clever. You, you need to have had a chance to think about it yourself to sort of wonder, how would I do it? And then you, it's only when you've thought about that for a while and you see something like this, you think, oh, that is clever. Um, to keep it going longer than it needs be, to keep it going for the four turns, um, and then to pick out of those which ones work for you, which ones work for me. But all of them are equally likely. 
Right, Pascal took a different approach to the interrupted game, and it was due to this that he um, investigated what's known now as Pascal's Triangle, although people have been involved with Pascal's Triangle for, you know, for centuries before that. But he did a lot of investigation on it. Um, what did I say here? Although it was known to Islamic, Indian and Chinese mathematicians many centuries earlier, it's justifiable to credit Pascal with it because he carried out the first systematic investigation into its properties. And um, various ways of defining it, but what I'm going to define it as doing is that we're going to have uh, a row of ones going down the left-hand side here, a row of ones going down the right-hand side here in the triangle. And then every other number in the triangle is obtained by adding together the two above it. So that number is two because the two numbers above it are one and one. This number is three because the two above it are two and one. Three, two and one. This number is 20. Well, you have to keep on working down it. Um, this number is 20 because the two above it are 10 and 10. So each number in the triangle is the sum of the two above it. And it's got lots of lovely properties. Here's all the numbers. One, if you go down this um, diagonal, you get the natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you go down this diagonal, you get one, three, six, ten, fifteen, twenty-one, which are the triangular numbers and various other um, nice properties come up. And Pascal not only introduced the triangle, which was particularly important, he probably did something more important. He introduced the technique of proof called mathematical induction. And he was the first person to explicitly set it out. And let me sort of show you um, an application of that. It's a way of proving something. And um, you'll see here that I've written down that um, each of these rows adds up to a power of two. That's two to the zero if you want. That's two. Uh, this is two squared, four. This is two cubed, eight. Um, two to the four, 16. Add this row here, you get two to the 32. Now, it's quite easy to see because of the defining property of the triangle, uh, because each number, that number is the sum of the two above it. It's quite easy to prove that the sum of any row is twice the sum of the row above it. So the sum of any row is twice the sum of the row above it. But the row above it is twice the sum of the row above it. And that one is twice the sum of the row of the one above it. So you're multiplying by two as you go up. And then you arrive right at the top, and the answer is one. So if you started off with the sum here, the answer for this is twice the answer for this, which is twice the answer for that, which is twice the answer for that, twice, twice. You're doubling each time, so you just come up to the appropriate power of two. But you see the, the, sort of the, the structure of the proof. All right. Now, let's see how, well, Pascal used a similar idea in order to uh, solve the problem of the, of the interrupted game. But I can just sort of show you here how it relates to it, because one of the things about um, the Pascal's triangle is that it also tells you the number of ways you can, for example, choose two things from three things. If you've got three objects and you want to find out, you want to make little subsets of two of them, it tells you what the answer for that is. And here... I've reproduced the ways in which you can win the game, the yellow ways here, in which you can win the game. And you can see there's one up at the top. It's not quite as crisp as it was in the previous one. That's the one where you win them all. And that corresponds to the number one here. Then if you look at some of them, that one I think, and that one, and that one, they're the ways in which you can win three of them. So there's that one up there. There's that one there. There is... One down there, and then there's one down there as well. So there are four ways in which you win three of them. That's the four ways you can choose two things from four. And then there are six ways in which you can win two of them, which are the other ways on the board there. So the yellow blocks on the left-hand side correspond to the yellow blocks in Pascal's triangle over here. The red ones where I win correspond to the red numbers in the Pascal's triangle. And that's to give you another approach of being able to go about it. But the thing about doing it that way, because the counting is already done for you in there, is that let's say I decided, well, we decided, that we were going to change the rules and it was the first person to five was going to win. Not the first person to four, the first person to five. Well, 
if it's going to be the first person to five and it's interrupted when you've got two and I've got one, the most the number of turns we have to play is going to be six. If it's the first to five and you've got two and I've got one, then we'll need at most six to be able to, to complete. And in the same way that this was the situation where you needed at most four, you have to, this would be where if you needed five, and this is the row for needing at most six. And I've just coloured it in here so that the number of ways in which you could win are one plus six plus 15 plus 20. But the thing about it is, you see how I'm just reeling it off now. So I've got like an algorithm for being able to do it. And when you work out what that number is, you get uh, 35, 41, 42. So it's 42 over 64 is the probability that if the game were interrupted, when you'd got two and I'd got one, but we needed to get up to five wins that you would eventually win. Okay, so what I've been doing there is taking a couple of examples where the equally likely situation and non-trivial examples, one of which is the birthday problem and one of which is the Pascal problem. Now, let's try to relate that with um, what's frequently given as a definition of probability. For example, you will say that a coin is fair if when you keep tossing it, the proportion of heads um, gets closer and closer to a half. Um, or a dice is fair if when you keep throwing it, the number of ones, the proportion of ones equals the proportion of twos, approaches the proportion of twos, etc., approaches a sixth, and so on. And in order to do that, that result, which was first proved by, the result I'm going to tell you about was first shown by Jacob Bernoulli, one of the famous Bernoulli dynasties. Um, I'm going to illustrate by way of the, these pictures I'm going to show you. And here's what we we'll get if we're going to toss a coin 10 times. I can work out the probabilities for the different number of heads that can be obtained for cost tossing a coin 10 times. In the same way that I did, you know, I put all those firm, I put all of those things down. Or an easier way to do it, in fact, is using Pascal's triangle. I can work out the probability of getting no heads. And getting no heads, if I'm now thinking of fractions of heads, um, so I'm dividing by 10 here. So no heads, 0 over 10 is 0. And the probability for it is the height of the vertical axis. And I can work out the probability of getting two heads, and it's that height up here. And three heads is that vertical distance and so on. And the one that I'm interested in seeing is, how does it go about for the probability of getting 0.5? Because 0.5 is what I think the proportion of heads should be ultimately tending to. If the coin is fair, then as you do it, you keep on doing it, then you expect the proportion of heads to get closer and closer to a half. Well, I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to do it by doing it 10 times, by doing it 20 times, by doing it 30 times, 40 times, 60 times, and 100 times. And the little red things that I have up here at the top, they're the outcomes that are within 0.45 up to 0.55. So they're, they're straddling the range of 0.5. And what I want you to see is that as we increase the number of tosses of the coin, going from 10 to 20, the probabilities start to move in. Right? So here we go up to 30. And you see there, the extreme ones are becoming less and less likely. And the most likely outcome is becoming the probability of a half. And we have again here, they were going up to 60, right? and then up to 100. And this result is called the law of large numbers. And let me just try to say again what I'm we started off, I started off with a sample space and I just associated a number a half to the outcome getting head and the number a half to the outcome of getting tail. From that, I can work out the probabilities for all the various outcomes you get when you toss a coin a hundred times. And that's all been done there for you. And what you see is that the most likely number of heads that you're going to obtain is getting closer and closer to a half. So that the axiomatic uh, approach to probability, using this equally likely events in the sample space, coincides with the frequency event, the frequency interpretation of probability. Um, 
And in fact, there's, there's, there's another result called the central limit theorem that tells you how, how spread out these results are down here. Um, uh, so it not only tells you what the centre of the shape is, but what the, um, also the, the, spread, the spread of the shape. So I hope there to have shown you one of the regularities within probability that you do have this situation, that is, you keep doing the experiment more and more times and count the number of um, heads that you obtain, you're going to get closer and closer to a half. So that's a nice, well-behaved property. Um, but I want to turn it on its side to an extent and look at another situation. That's the situation of random walks. And we can think of this in various ways. We've got a line, we've got marks on the line there, and what we do is we move at each tick of the clock, we move up with probability a half, or we move down with probability a half. So you could toss one of those coins. If you get heads, you move up. If you get tails, you move down. Um, or it could be a model of two queues, where... Um, there are two queues. If the queue you're in is going ahead, you move up. If the queue you're in is falling behind, you move down. So you're doing what's called a random walk on the line, and the reason it's called symmetric is because the probability of going up and down are the same. Right. Now, let's look and see. Or let's, um, I created a little spreadsheet for this, and it's it's very nice to do this. So just sort of indicated this to let you know. There are facilities, there are pseudo-random number generators within the spreadsheet. And what I've done here is just use it to generate a sequence of random numbers so that either minus one or plus one occur with equal probability. So these are the subsequent minus one means go down, plus one means go up. And here what I'm doing in this column is keeping a running to total of them. So each number here is the sum of the number above it and the one to its left. Okay, And then I've plotted the graph of you going up and down the line coming along here. So it's the, the time is running along horizontally and what you've got vertically is where you are on that line going up and down. So you can think of that as being you know, the difference between the number of heads that have been obtained minus the number of tails. All right, so I hope that's... Clear. It's just a way of being able to say this is a, uh, a sample path of the random walk where you've got time going along horizontally and you've got your vertical displacement going up like that. Now, it took me a while to get that picture because I think it's true to say, I just want you to think for a minute, it gives me a chance to find my place, um, what kind of a graph you would expect. And I think it's the case that most people have asked about that, they think that in a long coin-tossing game, each player will be on the winning side for about half the time. And, so half the path above the axis, half the path below the axis, and that's roughly the case here. But they also think that the lead will change quite frequently. So they're thinking if you're continually tossing coins, and you're heads and I'm tails, then... Heads will be in the lead for about half the time during the tossing game, and the leads will be switching over. And I said to quite a lot of simulations of this, in other words, what I mean is generating you know, different random numbers and, and drawing the graphs, and in order to get that one there. And then I just did, I said, I'll just do 10, one after the other. So this is the first one of those 10. I find that surprising. Heads are in the lead from the, the whole game. So that means if you joined that queue, and there were two queues, you would always be ahead of the other queue. The next simulation, and these are just one after the other. Bit of oscillation at the start, and then tails. The other queues ahead most of the time. Right? They're not switching back and forth, and it's certainly not the case that heads are there half the time and tails are there half the time. All right. This is the cursor spreadsheets again. You can just keep doing it. <laughs> so here there is a bit of variation more, half and half, but uh, a big gap in the middle there where heads 
are in the lead and then heads heading off. Um, now there, heads again. As I say, I just decided to myself I was going to do, do it ten times and take whatever came out of it. If I'm sure you believe me. There. Tails are ahead most of the time. With, um, oh yeah, I think heads just does a little bit at the end. So there's, it starts off at zero and there's only one crossing in this. And I've got 500 tosses. I'm simulating 500 of them. There again, only one, maybe one or two crosses towards the, um, somewhere between 51 and 101. And then the, uh, it goes off like that. Heads all the time. Tails most of the time. Heads. Heads. All right. You can see why, for the very first slide that I showed you, I had to keep going till I got one that was a bit more balanced to coincide with what people might obviously expect. This is the case. It's called the law of long leads, or it's the, also known as the arc sine law. Arc sine is the mathematical function which describes the distribution of those sample paths. In one case out of five, the path stays for 97.6% of the time on the same side of the axis. So in one case out of five, when you join a queue, you'll be behind for 97.6% of the time, or you'll be ahead 97.6% of the time. In one case out of 10, the path stays for about 99.4% on the same side of the axis. Now there's an illustration of it, I got this out of William Feller's very famous probabilist, his introduction to probability, volume one. Now this is, this is very unsettling. It's just an interpretation, um, an application of, of the bullet point above. Suppose that in a learning experiment lasting one year, a child was consistently lagging, except perhaps during the final week. Another child was consistently ahead, except perhaps during the last week. One was lagging for most of the year, the other one was ahead for most of the year. Would the two children be judged equal? Well, if that learning experiment, if the outcome were just due to chance, just due to chance, like the coin toss, a group of 11 children were exposed to it, only chance, you know, no actual learning in it, one among the 11 would appear as leader for all but a week and another as laggard for all but a week. You get very strange behaviour of these sample paths. That's 11 people and you get that sort of a thing. So let, let me just give one more example because I enjoy this one. A coin is tossed once per second for a year. Quite relaxing. In one in 20 cases... The more fortunate player is in the lead for 364 days and 10 hours. In one in a hundred cases, the more fortunate player is in the lead for all but 30 minutes. Now, and I'll try to reconcile that for you in just a minute, but just let me say the other point. The number of ties or crossings of the horizontal axis, you know, where they come back to being even. They come back to being par, where they cross the axis again. Normal intuition is to expect that if you play for four times as long, you'll get four times as many crossings of the axis. But it doesn't. It doesn't go up like that. It goes up as the square root. So that if you play for four times as long, you only get twice as many crossings of the axis. If you play for nine times as long, you only get three many times. Uh, so it increases as the square root of the time. So let me try to, with, so I'm sort of re going to read this because it, um, uh, right, I've said, these results are surprising. The symmetry of the fair coin is still here, but the symmetry does not show itself in half the path being above the axis and half below. That's not how the symmetry shows itself. The symmetry shows itself in that half the sample paths are mostly above the axis. 
and half the sample paths are mainly below the axis. The language is quite hard. It's not saying that each path is half above the axis and half below. It's saying half the paths are above the axis or half the paths are below. So the symmetry is still there, but it's a different kind of symmetry. All right. And this is the artistic bit put in for Valerie. This is uh, something pleasant. This is Anthony Gormley's Quantum Cloud. I think it's next to the Millennium Dome, and I think it's one of its tallest sculptures. And what you have at the centre of it, you've got a large model of Gormley's body. Um, you can perhaps see that towards the centre of the, of the cloud. And what you then start off from every point on the body is that you perform a random walk coming out from it. And along that random walk, you, you, you place a, a, um, a tetrahedron in order to illustrate. I only did a one random walk in one dimension, but you can do it in two or three. You know, you just sort of, um, you throw a coin which tells you how far to go in each of the directions, the X, the Y and Z direction. All right. Now, these path things, you can look at them as well in various other kinds of ways, but I'll go on now to finish with um, the little bit about Einstein and Brownian motion. And as I say, in 1905, he had this result on quanta of energy, um, the photoelectric effect, which is what he was ultimately awarded the Nobel Prize for, in fact, and not for relativity. Brownian motion I'll come to. His special theory of relativity, where the speed of light is taken to be con the consequence of the speed of light being constant for all observers, independent of how they're moving, relative to each other. And then his, on the equivalence of, now what did he call, um, does the inertia of a body depend upon its energy content? And that's the paper, the fourth of the papers, in November 1905, um, which contained the famous equation connecting mass and energy. But now back to the Brownian motion one. And the Brownian motion one was, was very important because it provided very quantitative evidence of the existence of atoms as, uh, and, and other things. Well, Brownian motion was named after a Scottish botanist, um, Robert Brown. And what happened was in 1827, 1827, while observing grains of pollen, they, they shot out other minute particles. And he saw these minute particles observe, um, undergoing an erratic, um, jiggling, um, uh, wiggling sort of motion. And I think his initial thought was that perhaps the particles were alive in some way, but he saw exactly the same behaviour when he, he had in, inorganic, inanimate, small particles absorbed in a liquid that they went back and forth. And, you know, the reasonable sort of view is that the molecules in the water are hitting against the particle and uh, they won't always be in balance, which will give the particle a bit of a push in one direction. And when it's got to where it's going, then they won't be in balance again and they might push it back or they might push it further away. And you can get various simulations of it. Here's, here's one I got from Wikipedia which the, the yellow thing in the centre is supposed to be the particle and the black things moving back and forth, they're supposed to be the particles knocking against it and there's been a, a residual push in, in various directions. And it was Einstein who was able to quantify how far the particle would go and obtain um, quantitative measurements and, and predictions of it. And what I want to do is to, to show you how we can get to that using the idea of random walks, which is um, probably one of the best ways, I think, of, of thinking about Brownian motion. All right. And the, the crux of it is that what's happening with the Brownian motion is that we're getting lots of little impacts. We're get, getting lots of um, impacts that cause a slight change in position, but they're happening a lot. So that means that we want to have a random walk. And the core part of this slide is the top bit of it. Perhaps I should have made bold. We now want to think of Brownian motion as a random walk with infinitely many, infinitely many collisions, but very tiny, infinitesimal, small steps. So an infinite number move in the limit again towards an infinite number of steps, but each of the steps is becoming smaller. 
And I did that with a spreadsheet, which is the, uh, the yellow graph there, but it, it doesn't actually look any different from the previous position because the, the computer just scales everything to the complete thing. Um, I got another one off the web, which is the blue one there, giving you the trace, showing the very erratic behaviour of it. So what you do is, you, if you were wanting to do it, is you let the time between each step be divided by n. Um, so... The little time step goes down from being one second to being, you know, t over n seconds. And at each of the points, you let the jump size of size one over root n. And the reason that the root n comes into it was that if you were to look back to any of my previous slides here, you see what I've chosen as the, the axis um, from minus 45 to 45. I'm doing 500 tosses. But I rarely get more than, I don't get more than 45 away. Um, and 45 is getting quite close to the square root. I want it to be big enough. They don't get much further than the square root of 500. Right. So the variation that you get in it, it comes from that result that I mentioned before about the central limit theorem, is just going up as the square root of the number of tosses, which is why when you want to make the little... Um, little jump for it, you have the one over root n. So this is quite a difficult sort of um, notion to get the, the idea of Brownian motion. Um, what I wanted to show you was to show you something that really is quite important, but also that you can get to it from really this very humble exercise of, of tossing coins, but doing it frequently enough, and I've hopefully I've given you the methodology that you'll be able to think about it. Um, the things here are important because these stochastic processes or these random processes, they, um, they, for example, underlay all the financial mathematics that was done with um, um, once derivatives were quantified, etc. So it's rather a famous or perhaps inf infamous example of that. Um, the Brownian motion also has that characteristic thing that... Um, if you've got a Brownian motion of a particle in a liquid and you look at the straight line distance that it goes, that only increases as the square root of the time. So if you watch it for nine times as long as you did before, it'll only move three times further away from where it started. Um, the Brownian motion also arrives, oh, it's, it's just really so many kind of areas. Um, important in you know, queuing theory and computer science and, and in other kinds of systems analysis. So really what I wanted to do was to um, show you today really how the axiomatic equally likely approach coincides with the relative frequency approach, but also how just a simple game of coin tossing can um, lead to some magical and mysterious, you know, and counterintuitive properties of the kind of behaviour that random processes can show. So thank you very much.